you're following along and you see the logic, the linear order of things, simple view of reading, five key premises, um, and then moving into a slightly more in-depth look at these three skill areas that are emphasized in the state plan. I am not, I did not write the RFA and I'm not reviewing the RFA or your grant, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. But my hunch is whew, the, the state plan talks, it has a section on emergent literacy and it references three skill areas as important in the state plan, right? I think when you write your grant and your plan, you need to align with the state plan. So I'm inferring that your plan will include careful attention to these three things. But again, I'm not a reviewer. I know as much as you do. Okay. But what I want to do is dig into each one of these so that you walk out of here hopefully knowing a little bit more about each one than you did before, and so you don't make egregious errors in your application. Okay. Let's start with phonological processing. Um, in the Ohio State Literacy Plan, they use the term phonological processing. Um, I see it as a synonym for the more commonly used term <coughs> phonological awareness, or PA. Um, there's actually subtle differences, but I think they're not worth talking about. Um, so for our purposes, if you hear me use the word PA or phonological awareness, it's a synonym, okay? All right, um, so just to be sure we're all on the same page, we have a model of reading, D times C, and we have two important precursors to future decoding, phonological processing and print knowledge. These are called code-based skills. If you have skills in this area, they help you be a good decoder. So we're going to talk about phonological processing. Okay, let's engage in some phonological awareness activities to help you think about what is phonological awareness. Are you ready? Okay, I need full participation. Okay, boys and girls, let's clap for all the words in this sentence. I'll say the sentence and then you repeat it. Spot A to cake. Spot A to cake. Okay. My hat is green. My hat is green. Okay, now let's clap for all the syllables in these words. Ready? Turkey. Okay. Handkerchief. Handkerchief. Um, discombobulated. Discombobulated. Okay, now tell me a word that rhymes with key. B. Tell me a word that rhymes with boat. Boat. Tell me a word that rhymes with ship. Okay. Um, I'm going to say two words with a space between them. I want you to push them together to create a compound word. Are you ready? Snow man. Snow man. Baseball. Baseball. Pan cake. Okay, now I'm going to reverse it. Tell me snowman without the man. Snow. Tell me handkerchief without the chief. Handkerchief. Tell me burglar without the bird. Blur. Burglar without the bird. Blur. Blur. Robin without the in. Rob. Okay. Now, I'm going to say three words. Tell me which one starts with a different sound than the other two. Are you ready? Okay. Hin. Hen, hold on, I have to start over. <laughs> Hen, hat, mill. Yeah. Tom, Bob, Tim. Bob. Nail, nine, mall. Dab, <laughs> dab, bill, dog. Yeah. Okay. Now, I want you to tell me the first sound in each of these words. Are you ready? Okay. Chip. Sassy. Mike. <laughs> Fib. Strike. <laughs> Just, okay. Now, my very last one. Are you ready? You do realize I don't have any cue cards. 
make this stuff up. Uh, okay, I'm gonna say a, I'm gonna say a two-word phrase. And I want you to take the first sound off each word and swap it to the other word. You ready? Kareen Myrtle. Okay. Had Fair. Wold Kether. Okay. Okay, I have one last final task. Okay. I'm going to say a sentence and then I want you to say it back to me in pig Latin. Okay. Okay. My name is Sally. My name is you're terrible at pig life. <laughs> I'm a, 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 it's a, I always say. Um, little known fact that kids in kindergarten and first grade who do better on pig Latin tasks are better readers in their future. Why? Because kids who can do pig Latin have really good phonological awareness. Okay, it's actually a very difficult phonological awareness test. So you just did, you just did activities that require you to use your phonological awareness. Um, you just engaged in phonological awareness activities. What did you do? Okay, number one, you did listen. So it does involve engagement of the auditory or hearing system, okay? So yes, you were listening. What else were you doing? But what is rhyming? Okay, tell me more. You engaged in a rhyming task. You engaged in an alliteration task. What are you doing? So when I say to you, tell me the first sound in thin, and you say, what are you doing? Okay. So I say to you, what's the first sound in thin, and you say, what are you doing? You have it. Okay. What you're doing is you're taking a word that contains how many sounds? Three sounds. So you're holding this word in working memory. Fit. You're holding it in working memory. And what you're doing is you're segmenting off the initial sound. Okay. I can do the same thing. I tell me, tell me the medial or middle sound of fit. What is it? Yeah. It. Okay. Same thing. You got to hold it in working memory. Some kids who do really bad at phonological awareness is because they don't have good working memory. Okay. You have to hold that chunk of language in your head and analyze what the individual sounds or maybe the individual syllables. When I say how many sounds are an alligator, alligator, you're holding the word alligator and you're analyzing the syllable structure, okay? Nothing, nothing you've said, nothing you've said at all involves letters. Phonological awareness does not involve letters. It does not involve print. It is very commonly misunderstood. In fact, if I had made every one of you, if I had said to you, what's phonological awareness, and I made you write down a definition, 10 minutes ago, half of you would have said something about print and sound, because it's very misunderstood. You just defined what phonological awareness is. It is attending to the sound structure of spoken language. It has nothing to do with print, nothing to do with letters, okay? so. The reason it's important is because our language, like Spanish and Italian and German, we read using the alphabetic principle. Okay? So humans have been talking for millennia. Okay? We started talking a long, long time ago. I think Moms were picking bugs off their babies and started talking to them. That's what I think. No, that's not how it happened. Um, they actually think it happened to gossip. As we banded into bigger and bigger groups of people, we started to use language. We created language as a way to gossip um, and to talk about 
picking bugs up. Sorry, I just think, never mind. Okay, I have a weird sense of humor. Um, so we have had language for a very long time. We have not had writing for very long. So we had language. And then we decided a long time ago that we want to take these words and make them concrete and permanent. Okay? Why? What did we want to record a couple hundred thousand years ago? What did we decide we needed to record? It was not history. No? I believe it. What? Our story. I don't think so. I don't. I don't know if this is a, just a European perspective. I'll have to look at the literature. Um, but it was for trade. Okay. So I'm loading up. I'm I'm a warrior in Papua New Guinea, and I'm putting some stuff in this canoe and sending it to you. I need to record what's in my canoe. So I believe it was for trade. Um, if you live in Cleveland. I would strongly, 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 strongly recommend that you go to your downtown Cleveland library because they have cuneiforms there. Um, these are early, early written forms, some of the oldest available. I have only seen them in the world's finest museums and you have them in your Cleveland library. 2500 BC, okay? You should snag one. Uh, so, I mean, come on. Wouldn't that be a nice thing to have in your living room? A little cuneiform? Okay. So, a long time ago, we decided we have these words and we want to put them down. So, we came up, or well, it was much simpler back then when we did like hieroglyphics and stuff, but in our language, we're an alphabetic language. And so, what we did is we took individual letters and map them onto spoken sounds. It's, but it's not, a lot of people think the alphabetic principle is a letter to a sound, but it's not. It's literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sounds or letters that map onto sounds. So just as an example, we, to map the sound mm, we use an M. To map the sound cool, as in quill, we use this letter with a U, okay? For the, to map k, we use this. To map, in some cases we use this, a ph. To map this as in rough, we use a gh. Um, this is actually a sound, mm. A lot of people think it's two sounds, it is not, it is one sound, mm. As in ring and hung, that is one sound. The word ring has three sounds in it, er, e, m, okay? And so we needed to represent this, so we picked those two letters. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these. A lot of people think phonics is the letter going to the sound, but no, it's the letters going to the sounds. There's hundreds of combinations, okay? So the thing is, we have, a, we have a written system that is based on the alphabetic principle. The letters we write down map to sound. So kids have to look at the letters to get to the sounds which stand for words. That's why phonological awareness is important. So if you have a kid trying to spell out the word, or trying to come up with the word man from the letters M-A-N, they have to look at this letter and figure out what sound is represented by each letter. That's why phonological awareness is important to reading. It actually took people a really long time to figure this out. Um, there was a very famous study that came out in the 80s by some uh, psychologists at Oxford. Um, and they wrote a paper in the best journal in the world. It's called Nature. I will never publish in Nature, ever. Only the best people publish in Nature. Groundbreaking work. And they published a paper, and in that study, it was done with little British kids. I think they were about five years of age. And they had these kids do a task and it was called Odd Man Out. And so they would say to these kids, you actually did a test like this earlier, they would say things like, which one of these words starts with a different sound than the others? Remember when we did that? So it'd be like, mill, mole, nail, man. It's called Odd Man Out Task. And these kids had to do this task, and they followed these kids for several years, and lo and behold, the kids who had five could do that 
We're better readers. And this was a crazy paper because people were like, what does this phonology task have to do with reading? And that was only 25 years ago. We really didn't know. We really didn't know. So the stuff you're talking about, when you talk about phonological readers, this is new, relatively speaking. Okay? And people had to sort it out. They had to sort this out. And many papers were written on this topic. And what we figured out is that phonological processing, the ability to do this, is crucial to cracking the athletic code. And kids who can't do this end up being poor readers. And more importantly, can we teach this skill? Yes, we can. And if we do, kids become better readers. Okay? So this, again, this is the chain of logic. We want kids to read this word, and we want them to know that there's three different sounds in it, and then you want to access the individual sounds and then be able to blend them to then arrive to this. Um, did anybody, so did anybody learn to read probably 30 years ago, and you did like Jack, Jack and, Dick and Jane books? Okay. So back then, the Dick and Jane books, so Dick and Jane, I, I, sometimes I have a slide of it. Um, it's like, um, Dick said, hi, Jane, hi, Jane, how are you? And Jane said, hi, Dick, how are you? And it's this really boring repetition. Those, we use those books in reading instruction, and the focus was teaching words by sight. Teach words by sight. And that method is pre learning about phonological awareness. Okay? Um, when I I went to Catholic school, any a lot the only I'm always like, what did you what did you learn to read with? And we had a program called Professor Phonics. And the only people who ever had Professor Phonics are people who went to Catholic school. Um, but ours was all phonics. So no whole word method, just phonics. But that's just drilling. This letter goes with this sound. This letter goes with this sound. This letter goes with this sound. When you do those bridges, you're not teaching kids the underlying principles that govern word recognition. Okay, so when we talk, did you guys ever see Charlie Brown? Remember Charlie Brown? Is he still around? Remember, how does Charlie Brown's teacher sound? Okay. So speech, wah, wah, it looks like this, okay? So when we speak, it unfolds over time, okay? So this is time. Um, this actually says we, we something, I don't know. Maybe it's nonsense. But each one of these is a sound. So this is ooh, e. Usually dark is vowels, okay? So dark here, here, here. These are all vowels. All vowels in English are voiced. O, E, A. Uh. So they show up when you look at speech running along. Um, these stops here. What, when does speech stop? My name is Bob. Right before stop consonants. My name is Dan. Okay, before certain consonants, we stop the airflow. Here, here. Um, but running speech just looks like this. It's a series of patterns, okay? So the term phonological processing refers to the brain's processing of this speech stream, which we also call phonology, okay? When do babies start processing the speech stream? Birth. Maybe, for, maybe earlier, probably earlier, okay? So phonological processing is not something you do at four or five. Phonological processing you start to do at birth. Um, the child is born into Cleveland, Ohio, and mom is in the baby's face speaking what language? In this case, English. So what the child's task is over the first nine months is to program all the sounds in English, all 43 of them, okay? If the child is born in Cleveland and mom is speaking Somali, the child's task is to program all the sounds in Somali. Does that make sense? The child doesn't know. <laughs> you know. God forbid that you're Croatian. It's a very hard language. It's a very hard language. English is easier. So, um, sorry, I just said that because Croatian, the words are like this long and the child would have to figure those out, which they do, it's no problem. Um, but 
So the child's task is to get that inventory of sounds registered in their brain for that language. Does that make sense? So then what we're asking kids to do, they can already process. The key is being aware. Does that make sense? So phonological awareness is not just the automatic processing that happens, it's kids being able to look down on the speech stream and analyze it. So I say to the child, this word is fine. What's the first sound? What's this? this if this was fine, I want you to look down on the word fine and tell me the first sound, which is, does that make sense? This is routine processing. By two and three and four, we want kids to look down on the speech stream and analyze it. Because the goal is for them to be able to join this very close analysis by the time formal reading instruction starts. In kindergarten, we say to kids, sound it out. What's that mean? It means to operate on each of these individual sounds. So we train kids to do this very early. We train them. We train their brains to look down on speech as an object of interest. And this is why we're doing it, because it's, it helps them become a good reader. Um, so success in reading requires kids to be able to look down on a speech stream and analyze it. Um, some kids do this absolutely effortlessly. Um, I remember my son, he must have been about three, and I was going to, to a business meeting in Mississippi. He was like three, and he gave me a big hug, and he said, um, I'm going to miss you in Mississippi. <laughs> and then he said, oh, those have the same sound. Not quite the same sound, but he understood. He was looking down on the speech stream. <laughs> okay, um, so that's a really cool thing that lots and lots of kids can do. We get concerned when there's kids who really have trouble with this because it might impede their reading. When you have little kids running around with intermittent hearing loss, okay, why do kids have intermittent hearing loss? Ear, ear infections. Okay. Most ear infections in early childhood are silent. What's that mean? You don't know they have it. Okay, they're walk I have silent ear infections. Every October, November, I get a huge sinus thing, and I go to the doctor, or usually the minute clinic, and my first question is always, is there fluid in my ears? Because I don't think I'm hearing right. And they're like, yep, there's fluid in your ears. And I'm like, I'm old. Why do I have fluid in my ears? But that's what happens. And a lot of kids are running around with fluid in their ears, so they have a partial intermittent hearing loss. Well, what that means, remember when I said one of your tasks is to learn all the sounds in your language? Um, this is happening at a much slower rate for kids who have these hearing problems. And so we tend to see for a number of these kids problems with phonological awareness, and thus a heightened risk for reading problems as a result. A little bit controversial, but okay. So evidence of phonological awareness. What's the evidence for kids who have this? Um, they can play in games. That's the biggie. They can play in games and activities that require this. Um, they can make up rhymes. They can break words into syllables. They can match words that share the first sound. And I highlighted this because this is actually what's most important. When we if we're working, say, with four-year-old kids who are going to go off to kindergarten next year, there's a lot of phonological awareness activities we can do. We can clap out syllables. We can make, break words into pieces. We can make rhymes. Most important is sensitivity at the individual sound level, period. And it's not rhyming. Okay, it's alliterate, we call that alliteration, identifying the first sound in words. So remember that slide I put up earlier about kindergarten readiness and third grade reading? So that old crawl assessment in Ohio, it had alliteration tasks and rhyming tasks. So there are two different measures of phonological awareness. In my opinion, it is absolutely silly to have two measures of the same thing on one assessment. People do it all the time because they don't understand they're measuring the same thing. 
It's just one is harder than the other. If you then follow kids to third grade and you deconstruct that crawl and you say which one of those two measures of phonological awareness is better able to predict third grade reading success, it's alliteration. Rhyme goes away. Okay, rhyme skill is superseded by that individual sound. Okay, I want to say one thing, and I'm saying this because this is commonly misunderstood. You don't have to be able to rhyme to do more difficult tasks. I think I have a slide about this. Um, so, phonological awareness, this awareness to look at the speech stream we start to see this as developmentally, as something developing usually by about, about two, two and a half. Kids can play with words, play with syllables. By three, most kids can detect rhyme, okay? Um, what's happening is developmentally, it appears to be linear. We think, many educators think, you start by being able to clap out words, then syllables, then you rhyme, and then you pay attention to initial sounds, and then you can break words into all their little pieces. I put this up because the reality is these are not clear stages. They are smeared. You, you don't need mastery of this to do this. You don't need mastery of this to do this. It is not a mastery-based sequence. And I'm, I'm saying this emphatically because too many people think it is mastery-based. And so they'll work on rhyme with a kid for a year. If you work on rhyme for three weeks and a kid doesn't get it, who cares? Move on. Okay? If you don't believe me, we can talk about it. Because um, a lot of that's, it's a disillusionment for a lot of people to learn that rhyme is not the end all be all, but it's not. Okay? So I was just going to show you if you, I love this, so I'm going to spend one second on it. Can you see it? Who's that? It sounds really boring. <laughs> um, just saying. Uh, this is a little bit hard for you to see. I'm going to tell you what it is. It is a recipe. This here says what? Bake. What you have here is a happy kid putting something, I would suggest a pizza or a donut, into an oven, and you're baking it, and then here, I believe this is spray, maybe, but this is definitely sound it out. Sound it out. If, if you properly sound it out, it's obvious <coughs> that this is stir. Okay, and in fact, I would argue this is how we ought to be spelling spur. <laughs> okay? Um, and so here's a big spoon. So what I would you gotta put yourself in the mind of a five-year-old or four and a half year old. This kid wants to write this recipe. And he is like, I want I'm gonna draw a spoon, and now I need to spell the word stir. He's never seen it in print. So phonological awareness kicks in. He's like, and he comes up with an S. And then he's like, <coughs> comes up with a D. Okay? This is phonological awareness at its best. And this is why it's so important to literacy. Um, one of the reasons we attend to it so much is because of this. This is actually a pretty dated study. Um, when kids who walk into first grade, you have some with low phonological awareness, some with high, and you see this really massive distinction. Okay? One of the things that's crucial to understand about phonological awareness, it's really easy to teach. It's, I'll, I'll talk about it in evidence based. It's really easy to teach. In fact, reputable journals will not publish phonological awareness intervention studies anymore because they're so easy to do. And it's like everybody's doctoral dissertation is like, I'm going to train some kids to do phonological awareness and some not. And they all have the same effect. If you do a phonological awareness program, Kids learn phonological awareness, okay? Very reputable. Okay, print knowledge. So state literacy plan, three domains emphasized. Phonological processing, AKA PA, print knowledge, and then vocabulary. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on print knowledge now. So another domain of early emergent literacy development. Uh, again, keep this schema in your head, print knowledge, 
is an important predictor of decoding. So let's demonstrate our print knowledge. When kids are two and three and four and five, they're learning a lot about print. That's called print knowledge. What are some of the things kids are figuring out about print? Okay, they're learning, actually let's start at the beginning of a book. So what might they learn about the cover of a book? Okay, this is the title, but more importantly, what is a title? It's a brief, pithy, is that a word, pithy? Is it pithy? Pithy? It's a brief kind of summary or something about what the book's going to be about. So print carries meaning, title tells you what a book's going to be about, you have an author, okay? Print is different than pictures. These are two different symbol systems, two distinct symbol systems. Okay, so this book is called We Are in a Book. If you do not have it, I would strongly recommend you buy it ASAP. And no, I'm not married to Mo Williams and benefiting from your financial investment in his products. So then you have the cover page and you have an elephant saying, Estamos en un libro. In Spanish, we are in a book. What might a child understand about this page? Or what things might the child understand about print? Okay, here you have a speech bubble that indicates the words, well in this case, the words in a book illustrate what the um, characters are saying, and all of Mo Willow's books are like that. He uses story, he uses speech bubbles to tell a story instead of traditional narration. Um, a lot of other things that are in this book that kids are figuring out is there's a lot of punctuation. There's question marks, there's exclamation points. We think punctuation marks are hard, but lots of kids know what they're for. That's part of print knowledge from a young child's perspective. Um, they understand what letters are, what words are, and that letters make up words. Okay? Um, so there's a lot of things kids are learning about print in the years prior to walking into kindergarten. And we call that print knowledge. Um, print has a lot of rules. When I say what do kids need to learn about print, the first thing people always say is directionality. Okay? That's just scratching the surface. So if you have a six-year-old child who really digs dinosaurs sitting and studying this page of the book, what are rules about print that that child has to have internalized to look at this? Okay, talk to me about this. What is that? Okay, it's, it's like a title of the passage, right? So you know that this title, if you want to learn more about Dionanicus, you know to look here, right? Um, then the, what are these little things? It says deadly, gory, military precision, terrible quote. What are these? They're, they're like headers, okay? Um, what's this? It says scan me. It's, and it must link to a smartphone. I mean, you must be able to go and get more information. But you have to understand this is a label. Um, kids, this is really interesting because we think print moves left to right, but what's going on on this page? Yeah, you have to understand that you read this, and you read this, and you read this, and this, and this, and ideally, you're going in some sort of reasonable order, okay? Um, so this is what's called text structure. When kids start looking at books, text is structured in lots of weird ways, and kids need to navigate that, okay? So kids need to learn a lot about print to be able to use something like this to learn from. All right, so some rules that young kids are acquiring, this is probably the most important one. Print is a symbolic form that conveys meaning. Earlier I showed you that little kid, that two-year-old who wrote his name. He understood that print is a particular symbol system that conveys meaning. That's number one, okay? Um, every letter name has a, look, a, a name and a look. Print can be used to express oneself. Think about that um, <coughs> recipe. I'm going to write a recipe. I'm expressing myself. Print moves from left to right in all, all sorts of other ways. And really importantly, letters make up words. Okay. And I showed you this earlier. So clearly Coleman has already internalized a lot of knowledge about print. 
Um, I love this. This was my son when he was four, and he wrote his name. That's a very reasonable expectation. What's his name, by the way? Okay, so Griffin. <laughs> so I, one of the things kids figure out is this. Letters make up words. So here, Griffin's writing his name, and he does seem to understand that letters make up words, but he is there's something he doesn't understand about words. There's a rule about words. What is that rule? A word stays on a page, a, a stays on a line together, right? And if you want to break that rule, what do you have to do? Hyphenated and at the right spot, okay? So he has very sophisticated knowledge about print, clearly, but he, he doesn't understand something about what words are and how they work, but he'll figure that out. Um, I, I do a lot of work in this area. It's my primary area of research is print knowledge development. And I've always organized print knowledge as comprising four areas of knowledge. Um, so understanding how books and prints work, things like, how, I'm sorry, how print and book and prints are organized, print moves left to right, top to bottom, how are books organized so that you can read and engage with them and be interested in print. And then print meaning is understanding that print is its own symbol system that conveys information and that it has all its own rules that you got to figure out. Um, letters, letters make up words, all the different letters have a certain look and feel, um, and ultimately that letters map to sounds. You don't need to take a picture of that, I'll give you a resource. Um, Unless you were trying to take a picture of me, which is weird. <laughs> um, uh, okay, and then concept of, then the last one is kids need to learn a lot about words. So just like Griffin writing his name, uh, you need to, the concept of word and print. What is a word in print? What are the rules about using words as part of written language? Words are made up of letters, and ultimately a written word maps to a spoken word. Okay, the third domain, is vocabulary. Um, I actually teach an entire doctoral seminar on vocabulary, and we barely scratch the surface. Uh, kids' vocabulary development in the world of language acquisition is probably the most studied phenomenon of all. Uh, and frankly, I mean, you have the smartest linguists and developmental psychologists the world over studying vocabulary. People study this because we don't know how kids do it. Okay? Don't know how kids do it. Um, so there's a lot of work trying to figure out how in the world is this happening. You know, I always say you have a kid who can't tie their shoe who says something like, you know, make me that, otherwise I'll go hungry. You're like, where did you get the word otherwise? Right? We don't know how kids do this. We really don't. So this vocabulary is a big precursor to future comprehension. Kids with bigger vocabularies are better comprehenders in the future. Um, so let's look at our vocabulary skills. So for each of these words, I'm going to ask you to give yourself a score. Zero, I've never heard of it before. One, I've heard of it, but I don't know what it means. Two, I've heard of it that has something to do with, and three, I know it, and it means blank. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand with a zero, a one, a two, or a three, okay? So, babble. Okay, I got a lot of threes. Pontificate. I see a zero. I see a two. I see another zero, another zero, okay? Cachet. I see a threes, I see threes, I see a two, I see a two. Any zeros? I use the word cachet a lot. It's, it's a great word. Um, puerile, zeros, ones, twos, okay? And enthusiasm, okay? So I got five different words, and the one of, these are all grown up words. They're not basic everyday words. But even in this very well-educated group of people, for a given word, there's variability. I think everybody knew babble and enthusiasm, but when we get to pontificate, cachet, cachet and puerile, you know, your range went from zero all the way to three. OK? 
okay? One point is there's no trove of words we all know. We can't say there's these 40,000 words that everybody who's good in language knows them. Okay, that's number one. Number two, you only know the words that what? That you've been exposed to. Okay, you only know the words you've exposed to. If you don't know the word puerile, you've never been exposed to it, or you were exposed to it so few times so long ago you forgot. Um, and the third one is maybe the most important one. Word knowledge grows in bits and pieces, okay? So the word cachet um, is like style, classy, like having a big vocabulary has a lot of cachet, okay? Um, I use the word a lot, and so people who I work with a lot are like, that's a really good word. I'm going to start using cachet. Um, so you can start using cachet. Um, and, but it's like, it's classy, desirable. Um, so, but maybe some of you, when I put up cachet, you gave a zero. And you now just moved to a one or two. Now, if you don't hear that word again, you may drop down to a one, but maybe all of a sudden you're reading a book tomorrow and it comes up two times, you're like, oh, that's so funny. I just, and you're gonna move to a three. So words are learned in bits and pieces. And every time you experience a word, you flesh out your understanding of that word a little bit more. Okay? This is really important because you may be teaching in a preschool classroom and you're like, oh, the word um, manners, very important, very important. So we're going to work on it on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. You need to come back over because you're learning words in bits and pieces. So after day one, kids are like, uh, I know what it means. I don't know what it means. It has something to do with hitting kids. Okay? So you got this, it takes time to get that full representation in the head. Uh, vocabulary is what we call your mental dictionary. Uh, for most people, it's here um, in Broca and Wernicke's area. If you've ever known anybody who has a stroke and they lost a lot of their vocabulary system, it's because that stroke hit the left hemisphere instead of the right hemisphere. Um, so it sits here, and it's actually a massive web of connections. So I don't, do I have a picture? Uh, one of the reasons our heads are so big, which they are, we have very large heads, and babies' heads are especially big, is because of this whole part of the brain, which this part of the brain has developed most recently. So this, this part of your brain is all here, and that's a lot of our basic functions. Um, but language is something that is relatively new to our relatively new to our species, and then then you get things like higher order reasoning and all that. That's all here. This is real. This is a we call it the neocortex. It's a newer part of the brain, and it's big. Okay. Um, I have a Shih Tzu. Do you know what a Shih Tzu is? It's the cutest dog in the world. And this morning. I was sitting reading the paper and he was right here. We, I was sitting at a chair, a little table here, and he was here trying to get up, okay? And I was like, go around the table, go around, go around, go around, go around. I said it like seven times, I gesture, I was explicit, <laughs> and he could never figure out to go around. <laughs> and his brain is this big. Right? It's like this big. Um, and that, I mean, this is, it's true when you look at animals and brain size. So, I mean, I could work, maybe if I, do you think I could train them to go around? I don't know. I have a Labradoodle, maybe the Labradoodle, the Shih Tzu, I don't know. Um, but our heads are really big, and a lot of it is that building of the vocabulary system, okay? Um, so here's a couple things. I told you, I teach a whole seminar in this, so I can, I'm being really superficial. But a couple things I want you to understand. And by the way, the, the vocabulary system in your head, probably it looks something like this, where you don't know the word rain per se. You know it by the number of connections to other things. So for you to have a deep understanding of the word rain, it's because you have so many connections to it. So you're not teaching a word, you're teaching connections, if that makes sense. Couple things to know. Number one, from birth to seven, kids learn an average of seven words a day. Okay? 
And it's not because you're sitting there feeding it to them. It's because of the neurobiology of their brain and the way they're born and what's going on in the, the structural um, organization of the brain. The brain comes in and knows no words and the child's task is to acquire as many as possible. It's neurobiologically programmed, okay? Now, for the child's brain to do, this is what the brain is capable of. Now, if a child is, you know, in a Romanian orphanage and nobody's talking to them, this doesn't happen. It's not a miracle, right? You don't get the seven words if no one's talking to you. So this is the capability for kids who are talked to all the time. Um, now, the other thing, too, is don't ever, ever, ever underestimate a child, ever. Don't ever think that kid's from a bad home, I'm not gonna talk to him because he's such a slow learner, or that child has a language disorder, or that child just moved here from Somalia, because their brain, it works the same way as everybody's. And they, every child's brain, short of having a very, very, very serious cognitive disability, their brain can do this too, okay? Um, vocabulary growth is driven by exposure to words. Basically, kids are feasting. They're like little parasites running around, taking in all the words they hear. A lot of them are from overheard speech. And number two, though, because of variability and exposure, in this country, we have a lot of 12th graders whose vocabulary skills are the same as third graders. Okay? The first graders, whatever. Um, so there's this massive unevenness. So you go, you know, go, somebody said they're from Portsmouth. Who's from Portsmouth? So you go to Portsmouth and you go to the most challenged area of the town and you find a kid who's gone to not very good schools and had a lot of attendance problems. That 12th year, that 12th grader's vocabulary could be exactly the same size as my first grader who's going to these great schools and getting summer enriched. Isn't that crazy? We see that difference. And it's all driven by exposure, not capacity or capability. Okay. Um, once children are good decoders, so second, third grade, kids are good decoders. So this is a third grade text, okay, the classic creature. A typical third grader can breeze through this in terms of decoding. Their reading skill is highly, highly, highly associated with vocabulary, okay? So vocabulary is gonna be the driver behind comprehension once you can decode. Um, one of the biggest problems we do educationally is we don't work on vocab explicitly and directly. Okay, we kind of just hope kids are feasting and it'll all work out. But for a number of kids, their exposure is so constrained that they end up with really limited vocabulary. Okay, um, I point. I wanted to make this point that you don't just learn a word. Today we're going to work on imagination. Okay, we worked on imagination, check, all the kids know this word. It doesn't work like that. Um, and so what we say is to know a word, it's, it's actually an incremental process where you move from a very shallow representation of a word, like imagination has something to do with the brain. You move from a very shallow understanding to a very deep representation. Like imagination is to be able to picture something that didn't really happen, but it might be possible, okay? So it's gonna take time. And we need to build that time into our curriculum. Okay. So by the time kids walk into kindergarten, um, you know, a typical advantage kids has well over 2,000 words in their mental dictionary, okay? Their brain has the capability of learning more words per day than anybody in this room, period. Um, they use many, many different words to represent their feelings, their needs, their insights, their emotions, and they use words of all classes. They use, they don't just walk around and talk in nouns. You always think about vocabulary as nouns. Kindergartners aren't like apple, bacon, house, <laughs> garage, man. No, they say things like, well, last night I went to the movies and saw The Greatest Showman with my mom. They talk in sentences and use every word category to make those sentences. Um, and then the other thing is they can do lots and lots of manipulations of words. So they can, 
add, they can add verb markers, they can contract words, they can add on suffixes to change word class from kind to kindness and so on. They can do lots of really, really cool words. Don't ever underestimate a kid's brain. Okay? I'm simply giving you examples. Um, I know the literature on early childhood interventions pretty well because that's, that's the world I live in. Um, I'm required to know what everybody else is doing so that we're all staying on, like, what's the next thing we have to do? Um, these are just exemplars that I picked that I thought could be useful to you. I am not being prescriptive, okay? Um, and as you move forward in your plan, I'm happy, because I'm happy for you to say, hey, you know, we're interested in using Jolly Phonics. Have you ever read articles that say it's evidence-based? Just don't write me that about creative curriculum. How many of you are using creative? Oh, not too many, okay. Because we can talk about that. Okay, so your plan, and I don't work for the State Department of Education, I'm not evaluating these plans. My assumption is your plan will include some sort of strategy to address these area of needs in young kids. It's my assumption, okay? Um, I'm going to argue strongly that these are best taught using a combination of direct and incidental activities. Okay. What do I mean? Direct is pre-planned, pre-programmed. So let's say you use um, uh, Doors to Discovery. Let's just say you bought Doors to Discovery. And Doors to Discovery has four 20-minute lessons a week for language and literacy. That's a direct instructional approach. It really needs to be coupled by incidental supports across the day. And so incidental to me is seize the moment. Um, you're having lunch with kids and somebody starts talking about you know, the weather and you use that as an opportunity to have a guided discussion around clouds or whatever. Uh, so the best language and literacy instruction is a combo. And that is supported in the literature. So you have your direct explicit time to really hammer on certain key concepts, but you're gonna couple it with high quality incidental supports across the day. But this is a different, explicitness is different. Explicitness is not the same as direct instruction. And explicit instruction is being clear to kids, what do you want them to learn right now, okay? So you're sitting there at lunchtime and a kid starts talking about a dream and you say, well, you have a really big imagination. Do you know what the word imagination is? Imagination means, that's a really good word. That's explicit, but incidental, okay? Explicit is being clear what you want kids to learn at a given moment of time. Okay, so um, I believe you got probably all you ever wanted to know about evidence-based practices yesterday. Um, when you create your plan, you need to be employing evidence-based practices. Uh, it's not a bad idea. It keeps you from just making stuff up, right? Like, we're going to do youth yoga to improve phonological awareness. Um, I don't think you're going to find a study where yoga improves phonological awareness. Um, so you're going to go and you're going to look in the literature for tier one and tier two <laughs> evidence, okay? And there are lots and lots and lots of these. Um, so here's a couple examples. So for phonological awareness, um, direct phonological awareness training is something that, in my opinion, is tier one. It has many randomized, controlled studies um, that it actually, in the What Works Clearinghouse, that they talked about that yesterday, it's considered something with evidence. Um, so direct phonological awareness training, it typically involves small or whole class, short, discrete lessons implemented a couple times a week. It does not need to be intensive to be effective. Um, the National Reading Panel report from 2000 suggested that the ideal time of direct phonological or instruction that can be something like 10 to 15 hours total. So you can do like 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. And the thing about this is there's not a single developer or program. I'll show you on the next slide one that I've used that I like. Um, there's multiple, everybody's made up one. And you can say, I'm going to go and buy one for $20, or I'm going to buy one for $12,000. That's, 
That's your choice. They all are going to get the same effect, probably. Um, and the other thing about phonological awareness training programs is they only affect phonological awareness. <coughs> Does that make sense? If you, I'll show you on the next slide. So if you buy a phonological awareness program and you use it to teach phonological awareness, it is not going to affect vocabulary. It's not going to affect print knowledge. It is specific in its effect. Um, so this is something I've used extensively. I am not an author. Um, I, I think Brooks sells it, and it's like 30 bucks. Um, and it's just lesson plans. It's just lesson plans. So it's cheap. It has evidence behind it. It's easy to implement. So this is an ex I'm not telling you to go buy this, but there's lots of these floating around. Um, so I want, this is an example um, of a well-executed experimental study that implemented a phonological tra awareness training program. So this, this is a study that it was done in the UK. It came out uh, recently, 2008, 10 years ago. Um, and what they did is they had, uh, this is what I consider a well-executed experimental study that would meet tier one uh, evidence. Um, they had 152 kids, and they were on average just under five. Um, it was multi-site, there were multiple schools. Um, and what they did is daily short PA activities. So it was about five minutes. So it would be little lessons like let's do a five minute rhyming activity. They also did um, work with letter sounds and they also did shared readings. But if you think of the PA piece, it's a tiny little <coughs> thing um, a couple times a week. And they had a comparison group and over the course of the year, the kids who got the PA training did significantly better on measures of PA, okay? So I think you're looking for things like this. That, if, if I'm reading ESSA correctly, you need one well-conducted, randomized controlled trial showing positive effects on a reasonable outcome, no negative effects, um, and a couple other methodological considerations, including multiple sites. I believe this meets that standard, okay? Um, for print knowledge, um, I asked Melissa if it was okay if I talk about this. This is an intervention that I have helped to develop. She said it would be fine. Um, I want you to, my center, this is, everything I'm gonna share with you about this is free on the web. Um, we have a lot of resources you, you can use. Um, I don't have any personal financial gain to be made. Um, with the exception of our, my center will provide training if requested, but that, those dollars don't come to me. So um, sit together and read is an intervention that improves print knowledge. Um, you mentioned you did Star Ohio. Um, I'll talk, so what happened, the principle of the intervention is very simple. Kids are read to regularly in the classroom as a whole class and um, as you read, you embed explicit discussions about print. So um, in, in using STAR, teachers usually, uh, teachers in our studies get a book a week for 30 weeks. Um, and we ask teachers to read daily to the whole class, which usually is four times. Um, and all the books that teachers read are very print rich. So like the Mo Willems book, um, they have lots of interesting print features that make these conversations easy to have. Um, and there's actually a scope and sequence. So we say, as you read, um, we are in a book, talk about these print targets. Um, we all materials are free online at OSU. Uh, training materials, everything is available. The only thing that's not available is the copy of the books. You would need to buy those. Um, and if you go to our website, I have a book that details the entire intervention, and it's actually a free download if you want it. It's a PDF. Um, but we've done two very large-scale studies. Um, STAR 1 was in uh, preschool classrooms that serve children from low-income backgrounds, and study STAR 2 was all ECSC classrooms in Ohio, uh, multiple sites. Um, so just an example of what I consider a well-executed study. Um, this, we published this recently, 2015 or 16, but we had um, uh, 83 ECSE classrooms across Ohio. 
Um, and we have 319 kids in these classrooms who have identified disabilities and teachers implemented shared uh, whole class readings with a print focus um, on a daily basis for an academic year. And these kids um, with disabilities did significantly better on measures of print knowledge. And we actually just published a paper where we followed the kids to kindergarten. Uh, so that would be an example of, uh, I think, a tier one practice. And then finally, um, vocab's tricky. Um, it's a lot of the research on vocabulary in early education for young kids, a lot of studies really can't, we're having problems moving the needle, okay? So a lot of studies of vocabulary in preschools, we can change kids' scores on the words we teach. So like maybe you say, I'm gonna do an intervention for 30 weeks and teach those 100 words. We can change kids' knowledge of those 100 words, but very few people can change kids' vocabulary in general, okay? So this, the research community is stuck right now. But I found one good study that I thought was a good illustration. Um, this is a study on the, on the next page where um, these researchers taught preschool teachers to use a set of what they call oral language strategies. And there were three types. Practicing and promoting active listening. And by the way, the teachers were to use these strategies across the day, okay, all activities. So active listening, and this would be really listening to what kids say um, and responding in a meaningful way. Yes, um, your turn is coming up next. Can you just hold on a second? Being listening and responding in a meaningful way. Modeling rich language, um, using a rich vocabulary, providing elaborate um, explanations and descriptions, and then this one is providing a lot of feedback, using informative talk, like, yes, you did build a very large tower. I'm impressed at how many floors you got in your building. That's really high. So providing this really elaborative feedback. Um, and so this is a study um, from, I think, about 10 years ago by Barbara Wasek, and they had um, 16 Head Start classrooms. Um, and a total of 270 preschoolers they studied. Um, and they did extensive professional development with the teachers to learn these strategies. And then they did a two hour group training each month just to talk about the strategies and reflect on them. Um, and then they also had checklists that helped them monitor these. Um, and this is one of the few studies out there that got significant effects on standardized measures of vocabulary. Um, most, most people in this space are not getting big effects, but, but they did, and I think it's because they did this extensive PD at the beginning, and then they did these workshops. So that's a pretty sustained level of support. Um, in STAR, we don't have to provide really any supports for teachers, because it's so easy to talk about print when you read. We can get big effects. Uh, but changing the way you talk with kids across the day is something that can be very challenging to achieve um, for teachers. And you're definitely not going to get this in any curriculum you go by. I don't care what curriculum you buy and what they promise, um, most curricula are really inadequate when it comes to changing kids' language skills. And we can talk more about that. Um, I'm going to thank you. Oh, I'm a few minutes early. I, what I'm, I'm going to thank you. Um, I've mentioned our website a couple times. I'm from the Crane Center for Early Childhood Research and Practice at Ohio State. Um, some of the resources I've mentioned are on that website. And what I'll do is, instead of doing big group questions, we'll just finish a few minutes early and I'll stick around if you want to chat one-on-one. -on -one. But thank you and good luck with your plan.